In the late 1800s, gold was found in the Yukon. It was the richest gold strike in all of North American history, and it kicked off a mad scramble of men rushing towards the North on a desperate quest to make their fortune. But it wasn't just men who made that difficult trek, though. One of the first women to reach the Yukon in the gold rush was a desperately poor New Brunswicker named Kate Ryan, who made the trek to reach Dawson City, which would soon become a boom town. She became a fixture of the community, earning herself the affectionate nickname of Klondike Kate. Later, when the North was more developed, a charismatic but troubled American woman named Eloise Rockwell arrived in Dawson City by train. A talented self-promoter, she later achieved fame and fortune for her feats in the North, feats which seemed to have been based on those of Kate Ryan. When the American returned home, she stepped out into Hollywood's glittering stage with a new identity and a new name, Klondike Kate. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. On June 16th, 1897, a steamship named the Excelsior docked in San Francisco, California. A number of scruffy-looking men and women clothed in hopelessly out-of-style outfits disembarked from it. They were coming from the Yukon, where most of them had spent several years searching for gold. That night, news began to travel across the continent over the telegraph wires. The returned miners carried with them enormous quantities of gold dust. Every single one of those 68 miners who'd returned from the Yukon was now a millionaire. It was the richest strike of gold in all of North American mining history. The news immediately sent shockwaves across the continent as thousands of men and women were swept up in gold rush fever. Tappan Adney, a New York journalist who later became a key figure in preserving the customs and the heritage of New Brunswick's Woolastaquay people, would soon make a trip up to the Yukon. He wrote in his book, The Klondike Stampede. Every class of the community was affected. Companies were formed and stock offered to the public merely on the strength of starting for the Klondike. Men threw up good positions in banks and government jobs. Others with homes and families mortgaged their properties and started for the Yukon. While those who could not command the one to two thousand dollars considered the very least necessary to success were grub stacked by friends equally affected by the excitement but unable to go in person. The newspapers were filled with advice, information, stories of hardship and good fortune. But not one in ten or a hundred knew what the journey meant or heeded the warning. There are but few sane men, says one, who would deliberately set out to make an arctic trip in the fall of the year, yet this is exactly what those who now start for the Yukon are doing. In the background of the gold rush was a really quiet and extremely shy young man. He was too shy to really even get involved with many people up in Dawson City, but he always seemed to just sort of be there, loitering in the background, quietly watching what was going on. He was a quiet and overlooked fellow who few seemed to notice was writing poems the whole time. That shy and young man was named Robert Service, and he would soon immortalize the Yukon in his poetry. His most famous poem, The Cremation of Sam McGee, begins with the lines, There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. However, it was not just men who were rushing up to the Yukon in hopes of building a new life. The great Canadian historian Pierre Burton wrote, the Klondike phenomenon swept the continent at a time when the only jobs open to the female sex were those of stenographer, nurse, and teacher. But there are stories of determined and resilient women who defied the strictures of society and marched to a different drum. They did so in search of wealth, at least that was the excuse. More accurately, they went in with a sense of adventure and also to prove they were as capable as men of doing the impossible. The Yukon Gold Rush took place near the end of the Victorian era. Back then, someone's social class was viewed as overwhelmingly important, and women in particular were expected to follow strict rules of conduct and etiquette. 
Respectable women were expected to take their place in society as wives and mothers and provide a well-ordered, happy home for their husbands and children. The Yukon offered an escape from this world for some women. And escape probably is the right word because there was an understanding by everyone that the gold rush was temporary. Indeed, for the most part, the gold rush had wrapped up within only two years after its heyday, and the vast majority of the people who braved getting there had gone. One of the earliest women to go up to the Yukon was Kate Ryan. In 1922, some two decades after the events of the Klondike Gold Rush, reporter William Lewis Edmonds wrote a lengthy profile of Kate Ryan for McLean's magazine. In it, Edmonds wrote, Miss Ryan, who is a New Brunswicker by birth, having been born in Bath, a village near Woodstock, has the distinction of not only being the first white woman to enter the Klondike, but being one among that early army of adventurers which trekked in during 1898. Unlike most people who became noteworthy during their residence in the Klondike, Kate Ryan's reputation was not based on her activities in gold mining. As a matter of fact, that alluring metal she neither sought nor found. The reputation she gained was based on entirely different premises. William Lewis Edmonds actually hadn't planned to write his profile of Klondike Kate. His editors at McLean's magazine were probably quite surprised when he submitted an interview with her for their magazine. They had actually commissioned him to write a story for their Christmas special. However, entirely by chance, the reporter had happened to run into Kate Ryan when they were both aboard a steamship in British Columbia. He wrote in his article, While the steamer on which I was recently making passage, an opportunity was afforded of meeting the renowned Kate. Her manner was unconventional, candid, and jovial. Physically, both in breadth and in height, she surpassed most men. I quite appreciated the reputation she enjoys for possessing strength beyond that of an average man, but while big, robust, and muscular, her mannerisms were those of a whole-hearted, strong-minded, well-balanced woman. After an introduction in which the words Miss Ryan had been employed, she exclaimed, I was baptized Catherine Ryan, but everybody calls me Kate, and please do the same. Well, there are certainly things in your career, Miss Ryan, Kate, I mean, that are a mystery to me. What are they? Out with them. First, what in the world induced you, a woman, to venture into the Klondike in 98 when you must have known you were practically taking your life into your hand? Just the call of the wild. That and nothing else. And as for prospective dangers in the Enterprise, I didn't take them into account. When I undertake to do a thing, I just start doing it. The man or woman who is deterred from doing a thing which he or she would like to do never gets anywhere. But I'm moralizing. To tell you the truth, I never felt at home in the civilization that obtains in our cities and towns. In fact, I hated it. While walking along the streets of a city and gazing upon the paved streets, the concrete sidewalks and the towering buildings, I would say to myself in scorn, the work of man. That and nothing else. So I gradually became more and more obsessed with the desire to live and have my being where things were made by God. In other words, I had a hunger to make my abode where the work of nature and not of man. When the rush into the Klondike began, I was in British Columbia. And so I said to myself, here is my opportunity. The most common route there was to take a bus up the coast to Dea in Alaska and from there hike over the Chilkoot Pass Trail to the Yukon River. Prospectors ferried the gear from the campsites along the trail, on the Canadian-Alaskan border, slowly moving closer to the headwaters of the Yukon. It was certainly not easy, nor was it quick. William Lewis Edmonds wrote that Kate Ryan had arrived in the earliest days of the gold rush, and that she had selected a route that was even more difficult than even the Chilkoot Pass. He explained, At that particular early stage of the trek, no definite knowledge existed as to the best way into the country. She chose a route that took her on a path over the ice, which was difficult enough, but grew even more harrowing when the ice melted. She faced food shortages and was stranded, but fortunately the weather got colder and she was able to continue over the ice. The McLean's Magazine reporter interview with Klondike Kate continued. 
When her journey's end came, she had accomplished the extraordinary feat of mushing into the Klondike on foot a distance of 600 miles. But why did you, after starting in from the trail from Wrangell, persist in going forward in face of privations and danger encountered? What in the world would have been the use of going back? Sure, wouldn't I have only been going over the same ground again and seen the same things I had already seen? At any rate, I wasn't built for going backwards. When I once step forward, I must go ahead or... Bust? I interjected while she paused. Well, that word will do from the lips of a man, but I was puzzling in my mind for a more ladylike word. Naturally, I wish to use the language of civilized society in the presence of civilized people. Their destination was Dawson City. Crouched between the river on one side and the mountains on the other, Dawson grew almost overnight with the boom of the gold rush and disappeared almost as quickly, only two years later. I found this remarkable old letter in New Brunswick's provincial archives dated 1898 and marked private and confidential, describing Dawson during the gold rush. It was written by J.T. Lithgow, the new commissioner for Dawson City, and was sent to the Minister of Finance, W.S. Fielding, to let the finance minister know how things were really going up in the Yukon district. Dawson has sprung into existence in less than 18 months at the junction where the Yukon joins the Klondike River, situated at the foot of the mountains on a low, swampy marsh and the worst mud hole in existence. It has a population estimated at 35,000, mostly men. The main street faces the River Yukon, and as there is no drainage, it is in places knee-deep in mud. Typhoid fever has been most prevalent all summer, but with winter it will practically disappear only to reappear next season, it is feared, with greater virulence than ever. The main street is two miles long, and with the exception of the company stores, is mostly hotels, bars, gambling and dance halls, etc. They have rough, disconnected wooden sidewalks. The back streets are frightful bog holes, mostly small cabins largely occupied by the demi monde On the main street there is a constant stream of men going to and fro all the time. You see as many men on the street of Dawson as you would see on a busy street in Ottawa. On our arrival here, 18 of us were put in one small house and a tent, and I have since then slept on the floor with two others in one room. This house has six other occupants as well. The day after we arrived, the commissioner and myself counted 340 men lined up at 8 o'clock in the morning outside of the post office waiting their turn to get in. And when it closed that night, the number had not precipitably decreased. Morality is at a low ebb here, when everyone looks for a rake, a divvy, as a matter of course. No man would ever stay in this country for many years or even months living as we have, unless he could make money. Despite being sometimes lumped in together with the American Wild West, the Yukon Gold Rush was actually really quite different. While Dawson City attracted a lot of adventuring types, and was definitely a frontier boomtown, and a particularly large one at that, Dawson City was also, at the same time, distinctly a product of the Victorian era. This meant that for women who were there, like Klondike Kate, the restrictions of the time were maintained. Because people were self-consciously there for only a short time to make a fortune, hopefully, or to lose all their money, which was more likely, and then go home, there wasn't really all that much time for an independent culture to develop. Perhaps surprisingly, even in the isolation of the Far North during the Gold Rush, rigid gender roles were still the norm. While Kate Ryan didn't cover this in her interview, if she was like the vast, vast majority of women on their trek up there, she likely did it while wearing a dress. Not just any dress either, but a full-length ankle dress with layers. Even in such a faraway place, women didn't wear pants, no matter how much easier it would have made life. In a place where fortunes could be made overnight, 
money lost something of its power as a marker of class. For women, social distinction was learning and manners as a marker of their class. In a practical sense, this meant fulfilling a lot of little daily rituals to properly fit in. One particular ritual was visiting. Like anywhere else, Victorian women had to maintain their social status by visiting their circle of friends, or so-called friends. Laura Patrice Burton, who had gone to Dawson City to fill a teaching position, complained about the tiring and time-consuming practice of visiting in her diary. Anybody who was anybody, and some who weren't, had a day. On one stay, one was at home to the entire town during the hours of the late afternoon and early evening. As a result of this convention, it was possible, nay, necessary, to attend an at-home every weekday afternoon. Sometimes, on crisp winter days when we had been in the stuffy schoolroom all day, Miss Hamtorf and I would rebel at the idea of attending another day. Isn't it ridiculous, we used to tell each other, how much nicer it would be to go for a long walk. But in the end, we went to tea, to see, and to be seen, for it was a great social snub to the hostess not to attend. In this Yukon scene, though, Kate Ryan had thrived. She had built herself up entirely by her own means and recreated herself from scratch as a successful and elite lady. This certainly had not been the case back in the tiny farming community of Johnville, New Brunswick, where she was from. Back there, her family had been poor. Very poor. By the standards of Canada, New Brunswick was poor. By the standards of New Brunswick, Carleton County was poor. By the standards of Carleton County, Johnville was poor. And by the standards of Johnville, the Ryan family were poor. Back in Johnville, Kate had been seeing a man named Simon Gallagher. Decades later, aboard that steamship when she was interviewed by William Lewis Edmonds from McLean Magazine, he asked her. Now another thing I cannot understand is why a woman possessing such a pleasing personality as yourself spent 20 odd years in the Klondike without capturing a husband. Well, in the first place, women don't capture husbands. They wait to be captured. But to tell you the truth, no man ever proposed to me. And why in the world no one ever did propose is a mystery to me. No, oh, don't be discouraged. There's plenty of time for a young woman like you to get a husband. A young woman, eh? Well, that's good. According to Anne Brennan's book called The Real Klondike Kate, six years before the gold rush in 1892, Kate Ryan and Simon Gallagher were at a dance when he asked to speak with her privately. She was thinking perhaps a marriage proposal was forthcoming. Instead, Simon revealed that his mother had forbidden him from marrying a poor member of the Ryan family. And instead, he was joining the seminary. Brennan wrote that Kate, in an effort to perhaps mask her disappointment and her pain, revealed in that moment that she too was moving away soon. She wasn't actually. She just kind of blurted that out. But then, after she later thought about it, she decided that maybe she should actually go away. When she told her mother about what had happened, her mother encouraged her to actually leave Johnville. Her mother told her that there was no future for her in New Brunswick. Then she said to her daughter a phrase that she would often repeat in her head as she traveled. Don't look back, Kate. And so Kate Ryan left the tiny farming community of Johnville, New Brunswick. She slowly meandered her way across Canada and the United States, typically staying with extended family members, and eventually she ended up in British Columbia. She had been fairly directionless in her life until she heard the news that gold had been found in the Yukon. As she later told reporter William Lewis Edmonds, When the rush into the Klondike began, I was in British Columbia. And so I said to myself, here is my opportunity. When she was making her way up to Dawson City, she was with the first wave of miners, and she began to find her way in her life then. The miners often stayed in these massive tent cities. There, she spotted an opportunity. She built herself a tent restaurant, which she called Ryan's. When she made it up to the Yukon, she would go on to hold several jobs, none of which, by the way, ever involved gold mining. Unlike the later myth, 
None of them ever involved dancing either. Notably, one of her jobs was that she was working for the Northwest Mounted Police, who were the precursors to today's RCMP. She was perhaps the first woman to ever work for what are now called the Mounties. She would also manage restaurants and hotels, becoming well acquainted with a curious cast of characters that crossed Dawson City in their quests for fame and fortune. It was into the seedy bar scene in Dawson City that another woman, who would one day call herself Klondike Kate, appeared. The most entertaining, and certainly the most dramatic, description of this newer, younger, and prettier Klondike Kate comes from Francie's back house in the book Women of the Klondike. In August 1900, 24-year-old Kathleen Eloise Rockwell, a veteran of dance halls and theaters in New York City, Washington State, and British Columbia, landed at Dawson. Heads turned at the moment Kate walked out on stage in her brief form-fitting costume covered with red sequins and glittering rhinestones. Pink tights sheathed her legs and a black satin cape hung from her shoulders. She stopped in the center of the platform and faced the men who packed the theater. As she stood there, motionless, staring out into the darkened hall, voices hushed and the clinking of bottles and the squeaking of chairs ceased. Suddenly, with one fluid movement, she let the cape slip from her shoulders. Off stage, a single violin cut the silence, its long, keening notes sending shivers up every spine. She floated dreamily about the stage in a rising tide of crimson. Lifted by a whirlwind of music, the stage became a sea of fire as the blazing cloth surged around the red-haired, red-garbed dancer. The cheering men deluged the stage around her feet with gold coins, nuggets, and bags of gold dust. The person who would become the famous Klondike Kate was actually named Eloise Rockwell. She was born in Kansas in 1876, although she claimed that she'd been born in 1882. She had a relatively upper-middle-class upbringing, though, in her parents' opinion, she was a troublesome youth. She'd been something of a tomboy, taking up camping and horseback riding. Her parents tolerated that, but they drew the line at her apparently somewhat obsessive fixation on boys and sent her to an all-girls Catholic school in New York. She later told Rolf Shilios in an interview, I was only 16 when I read an ad in the newspaper. It said, Chorus Girls Wanted. No experience necessary. Picking apart Eloise Rockwell's real life from the mythology she painstakingly and very successfully built up for herself around her time in the Yukon is actually really difficult. It seems that in real life, she went as far as the British Columbian city of Victoria following her third fiancé. She then took off further north for the same reason that everyone else did, to seek her fortune in the Yukon during the gold rush. She, by the way, didn't bring along her third fiancé. She later recounted the thrilling tale of how she got to the Yukon to a reporter. My trip was perhaps the most exciting trip I ever made. The Northwest Mounted Police were stopping women from going down the rapids because it was too dangerous. Well, I was young and I didn't give hope. I put on boys' clothing and jumped aboard just as the lines were released from the bank. The Mountie saw me hit the deck, I should say hit the water, but I got a hold and was pulled aboard. He bellowed in the name of the queen and was fuming. That Mountie didn't get his woman, and I waved at him as our square boat went into the seething froth of the rapids at 12 miles an hour. So that was the story she told. However, Eloise Rockwell had actually gone up in the summer of 1900s, some three years after Kate Ryan did. By then, a railway had been constructed. It's pretty doubtful that she ever actually climbed the Chilkoot Pass Trail. I mean, why would she climb it when there was a train? In fact, it's not entirely clear just how much of that quote is accurate. A police report from the Northwest Mounted Police dated March 25th, 1902, indicates that she was, in fact, captured and arrested. That police report painted a very different portrait of her than what she recounted in her interviews. Eluded sentry at Whitehorse Rapids. Illegal alien. Personal details. Five and a half feet. Weight, 120 pounds. Residence, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Marital status, widow. 
Age, 26 years, 3 months. Hair, tar brown. Personal features, small, quiet. Nose tilted at top. Followed mining camps, Stevens and Cripple Creek. Employment, soubrette and prostitute. Crime, solicitation. Intriguingly, the member of the Northwest Mounted Police who was on duty and who was tasked with mining the women prisoners during that time was Kate Ryan. As for Eloise Rockwell, she was unceremoniously deported back to the United States. One year later, she returned. Only this time she was very different. She had successfully reinvented herself as Kitty Rockwell. Back in the States, she had worked her way into a high-profile and well-paid burlesque troupe and was returning a very different person. She was now wearing lavish dresses from Paris. She dyed her hair a bright red. She'd become a talented singer and dancer, known for a particular dance she developed called the Flame Dance, which involved wearing a crown with some 50 lit candles on it as she danced. I did dance wearing a crown of candles. I could have skipped rope and the men would have been just as appreciative. She was also a percentage girl. These were waitresses, of sorts, who would encourage miners to drink and then they would get 25% of the cost of each drink. She later told Rolf Shilios in an interview, Sure, I was a percentage girl. We got 50% of dances and 25% of drinks. My best night, I made $750 just for talking to a lonesome miner. A good entertainer was slow if she didn't cash in at least $100 worth of percentage checks a night. A man took his girl to the bar and splurged! Kitty Rockwell was, by all accounts, an extraordinarily charismatic person who could win over lonely miners with ease and who worked in collaboration with bartenders to get miners to spend more money. One particular bartender slash collaborator was Pericles Pantages. He was a Greek immigrant named after the ancient Greek politician and general Pericles. That apparently wasn't enough of a namesake for his big ambitions in life, though, and he renamed himself Alexander Pantages, after Alexander the Great. Alexander Pantages, too, had come to the Yukon to find gold. He'd come with only 25 cents in his pocket, and he didn't actually have a claim to mine gold, meaning that he couldn't actually do any gold mining. So instead he took a job as a bartender, and he soon ended up dating Kitty Rockwell. The two of them had an extremely turbulent relationship. While her letters to him don't survive, his letters to her do, and in them he admits to being difficult, moody, angry, and bad at communicating. He, for his part, complained about her drinking, and not much else. Her tendency to get wildly and uncontrollably drunk seemed to be his only criticism of her, and this would be an issue that would pop up thoroughly throughout her life. Despite their toxicity as a relationship, this couple made a fair amount of money, tens of thousands of dollars, and then went back to the United States in 1904. There, they got into a brand new business, the movies. She bought a movie house in Seattle and lavishly and lovingly renovated it into an upscale theater. He, having made vastly less money than she did in the Yukon, borrowed a lot of money from her and moved to California. There, he bought up a series of cheap movie houses and racked up enormous profits, and becoming incredibly wealthy remarkably quickly. Though the two of them were engaged, they were frequently apart during this time. She was losing money off of her movie house, while he ended up with this chain of movie theaters all over the western United States. It all came crashing down for their relationship when he suddenly married another woman. Kitty Rockwell responded to this by suing him for breach of contract. Obviously suing someone for breaking up with you is pretty unusual, and the ensuing lawsuit between them attracted a massive amount of media attention because of the drama between the two of them. The trial was very dramatic and they bickered and they argued on the stand while the public lapped it up. Kitty Rockwell loved the attention. Aware that the media was fascinated by stories from the Yukon, she adopted a nickname she'd likely heard in a jail cell, Klondike Kate. Meanwhile, back up in the actual Yukon, Kate Ryan, whose own Klondike Kate nickname was known far and wide throughout that region, 
was bewildered to receive concerned letters and telegrams from friends all over, wondering if she was okay. They had heard that she was suing a jilted lover who was a movie mogul. She was just as bewildered as her friends, and she later tried to distance herself from this other new Klondike Kate. That other new Klondike Kate, however, just kept on erupting in the news periodically over the years usually in conjunction with court trials, which usually had to do with Alexander Pantages, rather than anything to do with her. Alexander Pantages went on to build one of the largest movie studios. It was, according to two biographies of Joseph Kennedy, who was the future president JFK's dad, brought down and ultimately forced to sell by the older Kennedy, who schemed to do so with press baron William Randolph Hearst. As for Kitty Rockwell, she would go on to enjoy a late-life revitalization in the wake of that trial, selling the rights to her life story, which was not necessarily, shall we say, strictly speaking, accurate, to the movies. In 1944, the smash hit film Klondike Kate was released, which sparked a renewed interest in Kitty Rockwell. It would make her a second fortune. As for Klondike Kate, the real Klondike Kate, her life never touched on any of that kind of Hollywood glamour, and certainly never reached Hollywood. She stayed behind in the Yukon after the gold rush was over, and worked there for some 15 years, even after most people had left. After her sister-in-law passed away, her four nephews came to live with her up in the Yukon. Never having any kids on her own, she raised them like the sons she had never had. In October of 1918, the youngest boy, named Leo, boarded a steamship called the Princess Sophia. It would be the last ship to depart the north before the long and cold winter set in. Hundreds of people from Whitehorse, where Kate Ryan was then living, managing the Whitehorse Hotel, caught that ship. Everyone in Whitehorse had a relative or a friend who was on board the Princess Sophia. As the Princess Sophia made its way through the treacherous sands between Alaska and northern British Columbia, a massive storm broke out. The Princess Sophia struck a reef in the darkness. By the time the news made it to Vancouver, the day was November the 11th, 1918. One of the most tragic losses of life in the British Columbian history didn't even make front page news. Everyone in Whitehorse was affected, and Kate particularly so. She decided it was time to depart her beloved Yukon and move to Vancouver soon after. Her arrival in Vancouver caused a bigger splash than she likely expected. By then, the Yukon Gold Rush had been heavily mythologized and immortalized across Canada. She appeared in the city like a relic of the past, straight out of the woods, as a giant in this whole cultural mythology that we'd built up. A particular interest to the media was her friendship with and her early support of a shy young poet who would later go on to become extremely famous for his poems about the Yukon, Robert Service. He had spent a great deal of time hanging out in her establishment. Lacking a typewriter, she had let him use her own. Also, much like Kitty Rockwell, some of the color that appeared in his tales were not from first-hand experience, but stories that had happened to Kate Ryan. McLean's reporter William Lewis Edmonds asked Kate Ryan about her influence on the poet in his interview with her aboard the steamship. We fell to discussing Robert Service, whom in Klondike days Miss Ryan knew well, during which I asked, Pardon my boldness, but may I ask you, is it true that on occasion you supplied Service with material that he subsequently wove into certain of his poems? Well, yes. I suppose I did supply him with some incidents, which he subsequently wove into certain of his poems, but I was by no means the only one to do so. Service, having no personal experience with the hardships encountered by early adventurers into the Klondike, naturally had to obtain his material for his poems dealing with that period from stories told by those who had passed through the experience. But one thing he did know was how to deftly weave those stories into realistic poems. Just then... Our interview was brought to a conclusion by the all-aboard signal from the steamer's siren. Stepping lightly down the gangplank, 
Miss Ryan occupied a position among the group of men standing on the dock, a commanding figure, until a bend in Portland Canal shut out the view. I think it's pretty much obligatory to end this episode with Robert Service's famous poem, The Cremation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Now, Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole? God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. Though he'd often say, in his homely way, that he'd sooner live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold, through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes we'd closed and the lashes froze till sometimes we couldn't see. And it wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed, and the stars o'erhead were dancing, heel and toe, he turned to me, and Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seems so low that I couldn't say no, then he says with a sort of moan, it's the cursed cold, and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone, yet it ain't being dead, it's my awful dread of the icy grave that pains, so I want you to swear that, foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. Now a pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail, and we started on at the streak of dawn, but God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh, and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half-hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, You may tax your brawn and brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate these last remains. Now a promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies, round in a ring, howled out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh, God, how I loathe that thing. And every day, the quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, though the dogs were spent and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I felt half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing. And it hearkened with a grin. Till so I came to the marge of Lake LaBarge, and a derelict there lay. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and looked at my frozen chum. And here, said I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared. Such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. Then I made a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. And the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I don't know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out, and they danced about ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peep inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked. And the door 
I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile you could see a mile, and he said, Please, close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plumtree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales and make your blood run cold. And the northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Klondike Kate and Kitty Rockwell, voiced by Stephanie Tate. Laura Beatrice Burton, voiced by Monica Smart. William Lewis Edmonds and the Cremation of Sam McGee, voiced by Jordan Batstone. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.